I'm very glad that you can make it here for this uh, discussion of um, one of the most important books in the world and the man behind it. Let me just uh, share the presentation with you. Let's see, here we have it. There we are. So one of the treasures of the Nordic Bible Museum is a beautiful first edition of the first, uh, the 1516 um, version of uh, Erasmus' uh, uh, Testament, New Testament in Latin and Greek. And this is, the, this is the main topic of our talk now. And as I said, Erasmus, the man uh, behind it. Let's see the arrow button there was a bit slow. It's actually so important, this book, that uh, Daniel B. Wallace, uh, one of the world's uh, leading uh, scholars on the text of the Greek New Testament, said that the Reformation was born because Luther had Erasmus's Greek New Testament in his hands. And as we know, the Reformation changed the world and still influence, influences the, our world and especially the Western world to an enormous degree, even today, 500 years later. Um, one of the lectures that we have been given, have given before is the, uh, the one of the five most important men in the um, transmission of the Bible to our day and how these are related. And I'll just give you a brief overview of this. If you have seen this before, it can serve as a repetition. And if not, uh, it's um, a good background for uh, the talk now. Uh, the um, Jerome <clears throat> was uh, uh, a scholar that lived at the end of the um, the fourth and beginning of the fifth uh, century. Uh, he was assigned by the Pope at that time to um, translate uh, the Bible or edit the old Latin versions of the Bible into the modern uh, Latin of the time. Uh, that was the, the language that people at large used at that, at that time. And his translation became known as the Vulgate, the Vulgate Bible. And that Bible had an enormous influence and still has uh, even today, uh, 1600 years um, later. And it impacted everything and everyone in the medieval world for a thousand years. How people taught, how people spoke, how people wrote art, everything. And all the first uh, Bible translations into the vernacular languages, that is the languages of the, the, the modern languages like uh, German, English, etc., were actually made from uh, Jerome's Latin uh, Bible. And when uh, Gutenberg invite, uh, invents the printing technology, he takes the Latin Bible of Jerome and puts it into print. And that, uh, uh, his invention, of course, revolutionized the world. And as a result of that, uh, he was uh, named the man of the millennium uh, a few years back of when we left uh, the previous millennium and entered into a, a new one. Um, so, uh, but then the, um, the, the, the Latin Bible continued to be the most important uh, Bible for a long time, even though um, Bibles started to be printed in other languages as well. Latin was the language of the scholars, of the universities, of the academia. And uh, one of the great uh, scholars 
uh, was Erasmus, which we're going to talk more about, of course, in this um, in this talk. And he was an expert on on Latin and uh, a lover of the uh, Latin Bible, but he wanted to improve it. And uh, as a result of that, he also uh, wanted to construct, uh, reconstruct the Greek, original Greek text of the New Testament. And then Martin Luther, also knowing Latin and the Latin Bible very well, takes Erasmus's Greek New Testament, translate, translates it into German, uh, also one of the most important books of all history, and uses it as a tool to further what has become known as Reformation. And then a couple of years later, a man called William Tyndale takes uh, the Greek Testament of Erasmus in a third edition and uh, translated into English. And his translation lives on all the way into the King James Bible, which uh, we talked about in, a, in another lecture uh, just a few weeks back, that became the, the most widely distributed and printed book of all time. So we can see how these, uh, how it all ties together, but we also get a little bit of understanding of the importance of the work that the man in the middle here, Erasmus, um, did. The time around Erasmus, the life of Erasmus uh, was a time of, uh, many great events that uh, changed the world and uh, the world today still reflects these uh, changes. In 1453, uh, the last hall of the Roman Empire, the Eastern, fell to the Muslims. As a, as, as a result of that, a lot of uh, Greek uh, speaking uh, scholars fled to the West, bringing with them uh, their uh, manuscripts. And that incited uh, interest in, in Greek language and in uh, being able to read uh, the Bible in, in Greek. Then in 1454, just a year later, Gutenberg um, brings his Bible to the market, starting the printing revolution. And, and as we know, a great majority of, of the, the, the books being printed in the first 50 years thereafter were Bibles. Then towards the 15th century, uh, Columbus discovers America or America discovers Columbus, whatever. But um, an event that uh, opened up for a new time of um, discovery and, uh, and commerce. And with that, um, a new uh, class of people, uh, merchants, uh, who you usually have an open mind, who'd be interested in open borders, free ideas, and also uh, many of them an interest in, um, in the Bible. So in 1516, Erasmus then produces the book that we are going to talk about, uh, to, that we're talking about today, um, which it again then fuels the Reformation, starts in 1517, it was just a couple of years ago, when they, it was, they celebrated the, the 500 year anniversary of the Reformation. And then, as I mentioned, Luther's German New Testament and Tyndale's English New Testament. So just here in this uh, illustration, we see three of history's most important books, whether religious or not. So at the same time, we, get, we go from the Middle Ages to uh, what we call the humanism, and um, we have a Europe 
where the papacy is weakened. There's a weak German Roman emperor. There's rivalry between the, uh, the, the most powerful kings in Europe, the French and the German Roman. And there's rivalry be between the Pope and the kings. And all this opens up for change. Without this, the Reformation, that revolution that the Re Reformation constituted would not have been possible. And without the Reformation, uh, it's doubtful that we ever had all the translations of the Bible into so many languages that, that followed the, the Reformation or was a part of re the Reformation. So I already mentioned the word humanism. As the word indicates, it emphasizes the value of man and uh, his life in this world. And it started as a spiritual stream during the Renaissance, uh, first in Italy and then, then it traveled north to Northern Europe. And it sought to take, um, try to, to copy uh, the classical culture, philosophy, educational ideas. And as this text says that the foremost name in Europe connected with uh, humanism was uh, Erasmus from Rotterdam. And there, thereby, thus he's also often named the, the prince of uh, humanism. We are also going to mention another term during this talk, and that's a textual criticism. But textual criticism is not uh, something negative, as the word indicates, rather something positive. It is a discipline that tries to establish the original text of, of something. And uh, the one book that has developed this um, to a science any more than any other book is the Bible. Um, and one of the first ones to start with it and to establish that as a modern discipline was, um, was Erasmus, wanting to uh, establish the original text of the New uh, Testament in Greek. So I kind of divided the talk in two parts. First, the man behind the book, Rasmus himself, and then we will uh, focus on the book as uh, such. So here we see him, looks like, he looks royal, doesn't he? Came from very humble origins, but as I said, was nicknamed the, the, the prince of humanism and became the one person that uh, all the princes and kings of, of Europe wanted to have as a friend and were trying to uh, impress. But Erasmus himself, he never kind of um, confined himself to one idea or, or one party or uh, anything like that. It's, it's been said that he is the one who kind of laid the egg that Luther uh, hatched in the sense that he laid the egg of the Reformation, the ideas, but he never hatched it, he remained a Catholic all his life. But then Luther, the man of action, very gracious man, is the one who puts it into action. Let's um, look at the timeline of Erasmus's life to get uh, an overview. As I, I put the uh, Gutenberg Bible in here as a kind of a starting point, to put it all into perspective. You see that uh, Erasmus was born, he was born about 15, uh, 1466, 67. It's most commonly um, agreed upon date for his birth. So that would make it about 12 years uh, after the Gutenberg Bible came to, to market. And um, um, so the, the printing technology was very, still very, very young at the time, but he grew up with the revolution that uh, printing technology constituted. 
Yeah, he was uh, the son of a, a priest, uh, which was not a matter of course because uh, Catholic priests were not supposed, to, they were not allowed to to, uh, to marry. So he was born outside of a marriage, and uh, we don't know much about the, uh, his mother, said to be the daughter of a, a doctor, but maybe possibly um, the um, housewife of his father the priest. But anyway, both his parents died at an early age uh, because of pestilence, the plague. Um, so he became an orphan quite early. When he was nine years old, he was sent to a Latin school. Um, and then uh, in 1487, he was uh, uh, persuaded to go into a monastery where he, the year after, in 1488, was um, uh, then officially uh, made a, a monk, an order of, of the Augustinians. And then four years later, he was uh, ordained as a priest. Now, one of the benefits for, for Erasmus to come into a monastery become part of that was to gain access to the to the library where he um, studied a lot of uh, works in Latin of the classical authors and philosophers and uh, and so um, he um, after he was ordained priest he became a, a secretary to the Bishop of Cambrai and then after a couple of years in his service, he was allowed to uh, mo move to Paris to study language and philosophy at the University of uh, Sorbonne. He didn't like it there. It was said to be one of the toughest time of, times of his life. He always had a poor health. Um, he was poor and he fell out with the teachers. Um, so after a couple of um, years, he, um, he moved to England, where he um, then befriended some of the, um, the early uh, uh, English uh, reformers, we could, uh, we could say, like uh, Thomas More and John Collett. Uh, it's not right for me to say reformers because um, Thomas More was certainly not a re reformer. We'll return a little bit to him in later, but leading theologians then at the time in, in England. So this uh, encounter with the, these men uh, in for, um, kind of strengthened his um, determination to wanting to, to study uh, the Bible and more. Um, he, Erasmus, wrote a number of books during his life, actually became the best-selling author of all time until Martin Luther uh, came to the scene with his uh, books and Bibles. Um, but I just mentioned uh, one here, actually, the Manual of a Christian Soldier from 1503. Um, the year after, uh, he, in order to evade the, the plague, <laughs> we understand that uh, pandemics and, and so is not, is not something new. Uh, we know that in medieval Europe, the, the plague was uh, roaming about and uh, harassing people and towns uh, uh, with a great number in, in, in dead. So uh, Erasmus, he wanted to evade the, the plague. So he um, moved to Leuven in Belgium, um, where he became familiar with a manuscript by Italian um, scholar and priest, Lorenzo Valla, who uh, made a volume of, of uh, comments on the New Testament. And what he commented on was upon the, the text of the, um, the Vulgate, uh, and uh, how that related to the original text of, of, the, of the Bible. 
So Erasmus found this so interesting that he kind of wanted to, to continue where the Valla, who, who died about the time when Erasmus himself was born, where he left off. So he made that kind of a, a mission and that was what led to his, um, his testament. And about the same time he um, becomes honorary or doctor of theology at the University of Milan. Uh, which I said it was probably some kind of honorary uh, uh, doctorship that he was granted there. And I'm talking, you notice that uh, Erasmus is moving around Europe all the time. Uh, and that is what he became. He came a, became a man of Europe, not a man of Holland, where he was originally born, or England, or France, or, or or Italy or whatever, he kind of, kind of became a man of, of Europe. Um, because after having spent some time in Italy, he goes back to England and uh, where he's uh, for, um, given a uh, professorship of Greek at King Bridge University and stays there for about uh, five years. It's interesting. Um, uh, that um, at the time when um, the average um, expected life expectancy of a man was maybe like uh, 40, 45 years, Erasmus started to learn Greek at about the age of 32. And some questioned that, why he would spend, spend time on that when he was uh, relatively old. And then he said that uh, he would rather learn something very important late in life than never to learn it at all. So I thought that's a very nice encouragement for all of us when it comes to things that we maybe wanted to learn something more about, but we haven't had the time and we see that the years just passed by. It's never too late. <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, there is a general belief that at this time, when he is a professor of Greek in Cambridge, uh, he that's he starts to compare the manuscripts that he have access to there. Uh, the library in Cambridge had and still have a um, very nice collection of uh, New Testament uh, manuscripts and, and such. Um, in 1515, he uh, um, is on a trip down to Switzerland, to Basel, where he meets the, the printer, Froben, Johannes Froben. And uh, they talk about um, Erasmus making an edition of the, uh, the New Testament. Um, we will return more to that later, but anyway, in 1516, he moves, he, f he leaves Cambridge and moves down to, to, to Basel and uh, starts working on this book together with the, with the printer. And then the year after, Luther starts the Reformation. Uh, in 1519, Erasmus publishes the second edition of his um, testament. Uh, the, um, and Luther uses that one to produce his German New Testament. In the meantime, the Pope dies, the same Pope that uh, uh, Erasmus has dedicated his Greek Testament to, and the same Pope that uh, uh, have um, uh, condemned Luther and banned him excommunicated him from the church. And then in 1522, it's the third edition of, of, of Erasmus Testament, but Tyndall uses to produce his English New Testament in 1526. And then we have the fourth Erasmus Testament in 1527. And then the final in 1535, 
And then finally in 1536, Erasmus dies in the same year that Tyndale, Tyndale is executed. So that was a bit of overview of the life of, a um, short overview of the life of um, Erasmus. This is Lorenzo, Lorenzo Valla, uh, the one that inspired Erasmus in his um, most important work. These are some other important figures at the time. There's another way to put Erasmus and the times into perspective. As I said, Erasmus was like a star in Europe at the time. So I put him in the in the middle. Um, if we start at the, the top, I, uh, the the dates in parentheses it's the it's the it's the year when these different persons died. So the one that, that died the first in 1517 that was the year of the start of Reformation, the year after Erasmus's Greek New Testament was published, was uh, Cisneros the Spanish cardinal, um, a great man of, of history, who uh, financed what became as the Complutensian polyglot, um, the first complete polyglot of the whole Bible. And that was the, the Bible in the, um, the, the, the Hebrew, the Latin, and, um, and the Greek. Um, and that was a competition, I could say, to Erasmus's Greek Testament. We'll return uh, to that. And then John Collett, the, the Englishman who had the Reformation ideas, died in 1519. The one that inspired Erasmus to study the Bible more. And then Pope Leo X, I'll re returning a bit to him, dies in 1521. Uh, very convenient for, for Luther and the Reformation. Then we have uh, Thomas More, who, um, who was uh, a very important in figure in England during Henry VIII, uh, became Lord Chancellor. Uh, that was kind of the, the highest position next to the king. Uh, but he was a stern Catholic, so when Henry VIII broke with the, the Pope and the Catholic Church over his uh, marital affairs, uh, Thomas More refused to accept uh, Henry VIII's um, divorce and, um, and some other things. So he was um, executed for that in 1535. William Tyndale, there's no picture of him because we don't actually know what Tyndale looked like. Died in 1536, I already said a little bit about him. Um, and then the Luther dies in 1546, uh, 10 years after Erasmus, while Luther died in, uh, Tyndale died in the same year. And then in 1559, the Bishop of uh, London actually, I think the only English bishop that was Bishop under Henry VIII, his son Edward I, um, and then um, Edward, his um, um, and then Mary, Bloody Mary, who was uh, also daughter of, of Henry, and then Elizabeth, who was of course also a daughter of, of Henry uh, VIII. So his Tunstall, he served uh, four kings and queens of, of England, and he helped Erasmus to publish his uh, second, uh, in the work with the second edition of his uh, New Testament. Uh, actually the same bishop that Tyndale turn, turned to for help when he wanted to translate the New Testament into English from Greek, uh, having high hopes that Tunstall would be positive to that since he had helped Erasmus, but he, he turned his call back on Tyndale and Tyndale left for the continent, never to return to England. So that was a little bit about the man. 
and his times and his connections. Well-connected man, we could say, that's for sure. Now to the book. The, I said, put here <laughs> the years 1516 to 1546, because the, those are, uh, or it should be 1545, those are the editions that were published in Erasmus's own lifetime. So this was then the first published Greek New Testament. And this copy here, this beautiful copy with this 505 year old book, 505 years old book is actually the museum's copy that we see here in the illustration. So isn't it fantastic? 505 years old book. Um, and I have, if you, if you see, I highlighted the fact the published because it wasn't the first printed Greek New Testament. That was made in 1514 and was part of the Complutensian polyglot. Remember that Cardinal Cisneros of Spain, he had the New Testament printed in Greek already in 1514. But it wasn't published, put to the market until um, close to about 1522. So therefore, even though it was the first printed, it wasn't the first published and um, Erasmus took the first place in that. If you com compare these two works, um, the Complutense and Polyglot New Testament uh, was like Erasmus's New Testament, a dig diglot. It was uh, made in, it was the Latin Vulgate text and then and the Greek text. But the Greek text was better than Erasmus's Greek text. You know, Return to Erasmus's Greek text. But it was made in, in few copies. Um, so 600 copies, it was an uh, expensive work. It was six tall folio volumes. And uh, quite many were destroyed in a, in a shipwreck. So it wasn't that many left on the market. And this, was also dedicated to Pope Leo uh, the Tenth. Uh, Erasmus's New Testament, uh, as I said, was also a diglot, the Latin and the Greek, uh, but the Latin text was not the pure Vulgate, it was an, uh, a, re a revised edition of the Latin uh, text. And um, with um, Erasmus's uh, textual uh, commentaries, where he explains uh, changes he had done in the text. And um, it is believed that uh, actually the main purpose of Erasmus was not to publish a Greek New Testament. His focus was on the Latin He's, and, and, the, and, the, and the commentaries. So he produces this uh, revised translation of the Latin Vulgate New Testament to accompany his textual notes, textual commentaries to, and then uh, to support this choice again, to, to, to show people to say, hey, I, 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 I did this change so and so, because the Greek text says so and so. He then also had it printed with the Greek text along that. So the Greek text was just an add-on it was not the main purpose for, for Erasmus, but of course it's, it has become famous and has so much influence because of the Greek uh, text. It was met, met put together in haste, uh, so it had many t typing errors. And in order to, to try to um, evade the criticism and soften the critic critics, he, did the tactical move to dedicate it to Pope Leo the Tenth in uh, in Rome. So both works were uh, dedicated to the to the same Pope that died in fifteen twenty one, as it turned out. And this is the Pope. He is uh, one of the the major, 
the Med Medici popes, so from one of Italy's most powerful families, the, the, the rulers of uh, Florence, which was the most important uh, city in um, Italy at the time, along with uh, Venice, probably. And he was a son of Lorenzo del uh, Medici or Il Magnifico, uh, which uh, is like it sounds in you know, the magnificent. Uh, and his father had him appointed cardinal. Uh, as you know, a cardinal is in charge of many bishops already at the age of 14. So we understand that this was uh, was about power, about power and money, and not about uh, theological knowledge or Bible knowledge. Um, he became pope at the age of 37, one of the youngest popes that there has been. That was in 1513. Uh, there was only a small technicality that he had to be ordained a priest first before he could be made a pope. Um, he uh, didn't, Leo was not that interested in um, the spiritual side to this, but he was more very interested in, um, in art uh, and research. So in that way, it may not be a co coincidence that both of these important Bible uh, editions were dedicated to, to this, um, this Pope. Uh, but uh, he uh, had some costly interests, uh, like um, supporting some of history's greatest uh, artists, like Michelangelo and uh, Raphael, and then the, their work with the Sixteen Chapel and so in the Vatican. And in order, in order to finance all of this, um, they would, um, he would uh, 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 sell seats, of, of cardinal seats and bishop seats and so. And the ones who then got those seats, maybe with the help of the bank, then had to pay back uh, that money. And then by, by selling these letters of indulgence, where uh, you could um, um, get absolution for your, for your sins by, by paying money. And if you paid enough, you can even get absolution for the sins that you might commit in the future. And this, of course, as you, you probably know, is what really provoked Luther into protesting and started what then became the Reformation. So as I said, this was the Pope that excommunicated um, Martin Luther. Just a few words about uh, Erasmus's printer, the printer of the 1516 New Testament, Johann Froben. Um, he was um, a, a, a printer that, that in some ways was a pioneer um, because he um, started printed, printing some um, small, relatively small um, uh, Bibles uh, that could be more practical to carry and also maybe um, more affordable. And actually the, the Bible Museum has uh, what is believed to be the first so-called pocket uh, Bible in its um, collection by Froben along with a couple of other uh, works also by, uh, for Bibles by Froben. And he also collaborated with famous illustrators like uh, Hans uh, Holbein. So let's return to this beautiful book. The um, Testament of Erasmus. You see here in the left column, you see the Greek text, in a beautiful Greek type. And then in the right, column, we see the, um, the Latin uh, text. And as I said, in the 1516 edition, this was a um, revised Vulgate New uh, Testament, but actually a quite relatively careful um, revision. Let's focus on the Greek text, which is why we're, to, we're talking about this today. Um, Erasmus used what he had at hand. And what he had at hand in, um, 
in Basel, where this work was done, uh, belonged mostly to a, a local monastery. And it was a number of manuscripts. It's some say six, some say 10. Um, here it's seven, which I think believe is the most commonly agreed upon amount and, 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 and which manuscripts. You, if you note in the date uh, column to the right, you see that uh, none of these are younger than the 12th century, so the 1100s, which uh, is not very old when you compare to the New Testament. That means they were made uh, at 1, 1100 years after the autographs of the New Testament texts. Another thing you can notice is in the content uh, because it's only one book, uh, one, one, one manuscript, sorry, that contains the book of Revelation. And that is one of the weaknesses of uh, Rasmus's uh, textual basis. Um, because as it turned out, that manuscript lacked the last page with the last uh, five verses of uh, chapter 22 of uh, Revelation. So um, Erasmus worked under a pressure, time pressure. So what they did was that the, the, was a quick fix. He tr he, he uh, translated into Greek himself from the Latin uh, Vulgate, and thereby uh, actually uh, creating a number of errors in 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 the text, also in his translation. Um, to me, it's a mystery that he never fixed that. Yeah, I mean, he made four, five editions of his uh, New Testament, and he never really fixed that issue with the um, book of Revelation, uh, completely at least. But I have I've, uh, highlighted the three manuscripts that were used the most. That was the one on, the only one that he had on, on Revelation. And then the printer, what the printer used, Fro, Johannes Froben used as a copy, his printing copy, was Meniscal 2E and Meniscal 2AP. So that was Gospels and the Acts and Epistles. So Erasmus actually did not put together one Greek text, took it to the printer and say, hey, I print this. It, the printer took these manuscripts and then set the type from that and actually uh, by doing so, he actually changed some in some places also from uh, Erasmus's uh, di directions. Uh, Minuscule, by the way, means that it's written in small letters. So it means that uh, it's it's younger manuscripts. Um, Alex uh, have had the, the talk on, on uh, also on on a webinar about it, the the. Um, transmission of, of the Greek New Testament text where, where he goes more into that. So this was the textual basis that uh, Erasmus uh, worked from. In the foreword to the book, to the Pope, he said that he had used, um, um, uh, that he had used uh, the best text, an old text. <laughs> And the Erasmus's texts were, were, were not certainly not the best, and they were certainly not uh, old, so they were actually neither. Here is an overview of, of these different, um, the, the five editions of Erasmus's uh, New Testament that was published in his, um, his lifetime. Um, I just highlight a few of the changes from one edition to the other. Uh, the 15th edition, the second edition, um, the biggest change we could say was that the Latin translation now was more like a translation, not just a, a revision of the Vulgate, but more towards um, uh, a separate uh, translation by Erasmus. Um, and that, that is the one that Luther uh, made his um, German New Testament from. And then in 1522, we have the third edition where, where uh, 
the the biggest news, so to speak, is the the comma unanim. That is the interpolation in First John five seven. I will return to that uh, shortly. But this is the addition that uh, William Tyndale used to translate the New Testament into English. And then in the fifth edition, um, and I mean in the fourth edition, sorry, uh, he also included the Vulgate text along with his own translation in Latin, the Greek text and the Vulgate in the commentary. And also then he included revisions from the Complutense and Polyglot text, which I said had a better Greek text actually than Erasmus New Testament. And then we have the final uh, fifth edition that uh, corrected yet another some uh, typos and uh, and so. Uh, so it's these last two editions that came to live on and uh, came to take on like a mythological status, uh, almost becoming known as a text Textus Receptus, we'll return also to that uh, shortly. I mentioned that we would uh, talk a little bit more about the comma unanim. Um, comma here doesn't mean comma like we think of comma, but it's more something that is interpolated, put in. If you look at two uh, Bibles that are highly popular today, the New King James Version and the English Standard Version, you will see that they differ greatly in 1 John 5, 7, 8. The New King James Version says that, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are, agree as one. Whereas the English Standard Version only says, for there are three that testify, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree. Um, 99% of uh, modern Bible uh, translations uh, to give the text as the English standard version. And it's just a very, very few that does it like the New King uh, James um, version. Uh, so why the difference? Why the difference? Uh, here we see the, um, it in the King James version that we see uses the, the whole text like we, we saw, the tree that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. This has been named the, the, uh, the, uh, the proof text of, of the doctrine of the Trinity when it comes to the Bible. So that's why this text is very important to, to some to hold on to. Um, if you, um, I said that the Luther translated from Erasmus' 1519 edition, it did not include this interpolation. Erasmus refused to take it, to have it as part of his first edition and the second edition because there was no Greek text that supported it. And, and, <clears throat> and it wasn't in the, in the, um, so, so that's why he refused to, uh, to include it. And as I said, Luther translated from his, his, um, uh, his um, second edition. So, there, so the Luther Bible has never included this uh, interpolation. And that's why it has never become uh, actually um, part of the German uh, Bible either. But in the 1522 edition, Erasmus included this. And why did he do, do that? There are different uh, theories as to why he did it. But probably he did it because he did not want to let what was to him like a detail in the Greek text destroy for the importance of his Latin translation. The editor of the Complutense and Polyglot had attacked Erasmus for not including this, uh, this text. In the Complutense and Polyglot, they had, they had taken the, um, the, uh, the Latin text and actually uh, from the uh, Vulgate and then translated it into Greek. 
and then put it in 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 the text since it didn't have any Greek manuscript that supported it. But they still believed it was so important to a fundamental doctrine like the Trinity that they uh, must have it there, that it must be part of the original Bible. So it's believed that Erasmus finally gave in, included it in his uh, third edition. But the consequence of that is that Tyndale used this uh, edition to translate the New Testament and into English in 1526. And thus it became eventually a part of the Kingdom's Bible and the English Bible. So, there, so therefore, as you see, the consequence in the, in the world of the German Bible, it has never had, it's never been part of that where it has been traditionally part of the English um, Bible until, yeah, like 100, 150 years ago. So, uh, small cha uh, I mean, the changes in the text can sometimes also bring about big consequences. Yeah, little summary just about the summary, the influence of Rasmus New Testament. Over 300,000 copies were in circulation in only in Rasmus's lifetime. And was reprinted at least 69 times between only between 1516 and 1536 in those 20 years. 69 uh, reprints. It stimulated an interest in the Greek New Testament. It became the basis for the most important Bible translations of all history into German and English, and also into uh, an enormous amount of other languages like uh, French, the Scandinavian languages, Spanish, etc. Et and it also became known as the Tectus Receptus, the, the, the um, handed over text, and actually was the basis for translations into New Testament all, all the way until 1881, actually, when the Westcott and Hort Greek New Testament was, was produced to, uh, to challenge um, that uh, situation. Uh, so just a little bit about importance. The Little Bible is on the UNESCO list of the World Heritage. The King James Bible um, as I said, the world's most printed uh, book. <clears throat> Erasmus also with his work um, then set the start for a textual criticism leading today's uh, scientific text that I used for translation of most uh, modern Bibles today. Um, not all were happy with Erasmus and his uh, testament. Actually, after he, he died, uh, all of his books were placed on the, um, the Vatican's um, Catholic Church list of banned books. And the church meeting in, in Trent in 1546, um, 10 years after he died, uh, said that the Vulgate uh, should and will continue to be the only Bible that should be used by the church, and he condemned Erasmus's uh, New Testament. And as a result of this, his Greek New Testament was thereafter only used by Protestants, Lutherans. So, as I said, Erasmus was uh, the prince of humanism, uh, star in Europe at the time, best selling author of a uh, before Luther came on to the scene. And, uh, but the man who uh, uh, laid the egg to the Reformation that uh, Luther hatched, but himself remained a Catholic uh, to his dying day. Truly one of the five most important uh, men in the transmission of, of the Bible. And it's in a way proper that he kind of has the, the middle centerpiece here in this, uh, this chart. Uh, his friend, uh, John Collett, upon receiving a copy of Erasmus Testament said, the name of Erasmus shall never perish. 
and at least now for 505 years since the publication of the 15th and 16th Greek New Testament, his name is uh, more uh, uh, actual than uh, ever. So um, that kind of prophecy has uh, proved true all the way until uh, now. If you want to read more, these are three of my favorite books when it comes to the transmission of the Bible. That doesn't only deal with uh, Erasmus and the Greek New Testament, but puts it all into perspective. They're beautiful illustrated um, uh, books, uh, highly recommended. And also very good articles on uh, Wikipedia also. So uh, I would just like to thank you so much for your attention. And I hope that this has maybe made you curious to learn a little bit more about this uh, so very important time in the history of not only the, the Bible, but of um, humanity and, uh, and the world as such. Thank you so much.